this is going to be a challenge because I quite often waffle on uh, when I'm giving presentations. Uh, I'm going to talk about my research, um, which focuses on the, the human brain. Um, and as we know, uh, essentially the brain functions on two levels, two levels, uh, an electrical and a chemical level. So electrochemistry uh, is a, a good tool. My training is in electrochemistry at my PhD in electrochemistry in UCD. And we use this technique to measure chemicals in the brain. So a species that we're all common or familiar with is dopamine. And we use an electrode, and you can uh, measure dopamine concentrations at the electrode. You apply a voltage and you get a signal or current. These are different compounds that are present in the brain, ascorbic acid, dopamine, serotonin. Uh, there are compounds like glucose and glutamate that are also present, uh, but these are non-electroactive, so it's very hard to measure them at an electrode, uh, and that's a challenge. This is a typical electrode, and the top shows a carbon paste electrode. The thing to take from this slide is the dimensions. 300 microns for a carbon paste, a platinum wire about 125 microns, and carbon fiber about 8 microns. So there's a variety of different sizes we can use. And essentially what we do is we take these electrodes and we implant them into the brain, into a brain region that we're interested in recording from. Um, it could be the, the cortex uh, for executive function, um, or learning and memory, for example, the, the hippocampus. Uh, this is a glucose biosensor. As I said, glucose is a non-electroactive species, so it's impossible to get a signal from it unless you modify the electrode with a biological agent. In this case, we use an enzyme. The enzyme is immobilized on the electrode surface, uh, and you get a signal from when the glucose reacts with the electrode. And this shows some data from uh, brain glucose measurements. The top one is where you perfuse glucose. This is insulin, an agent known to change glucose. And over on the far side there is ascorbic acid or vitamin C. And that's one of the challenges in this, in this, using this technology. There are lots of different chemicals in the brain, and they interact uh, with the, uh, interfere with the signals. Nitric oxide is another very important species molecule of the year. About 10 years ago, we developed a sensor. This is a calibration showing increases in current uh, for nitric oxide. And again, this is some data from, from animal work where we implanted the sensor. Uh, L-arginine is a precursor <coughs> for nitric oxide, so when you inject an arginine, you see an increase in the signal coming back to baseline. L-name is a, is a a compound that interferes with uh, um, nitric oxide synthesis, a molecule that synthesizes nitric oxide, we saw a decrease there, confirming that the electrodes respond to nitric oxide. Um, this is a paper from a Swedish group that we started collaborating with years ago, showing the relationship between nitric oxide and fencyclidine. Fencyclidine is involved in schizophrenia. It's a molecule that induces schizophrenia in animals, and we've shown that nitric oxide is an implication in that. And we also interact with a lot of companies. Eli Lilly is one of these companies. And about five years ago, they established a Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. And we're the only Irish university involved in that. And that's in developing new treatments for things like schizophrenia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things we became interested in as well was the um, relationship between uh, different brain regions. And this is dorsal and ventral hippocampus, uh, taught to be associated with anxiety uh, and uh, uh, spatial recognition. Uh, for example, this is an electrode implanted in dorsal and ventral hippocampus, red and blue. You push an unfamiliar rash into a familiar rash, that causes high anxiety. And we can see that the signal is different uh, for two brain regions. Uh, and this is a paper that came out of that work where we published uh, uh, you know, a really interesting paper showing that uh, a brain region hippocampus, which is dorsal and ventral regions, shows different signals. Uh, so we're starting to use the technology uh, to really look at how different parts of the brain function uh, in real time, in the same uh, at the same moment. <coughs> uh, again, the collaboration here was with uh, the University of Oxford and also with the Eli Lilly. Um, and one of the things we started to, to move towards recently is taking the technology into humans to go from preclinical animal models into human models. Of course, we're all familiar with fMRI machines. The standard picture that we see from <coughs> fMRI, the signal beside it was your bold fMRI signal, quantitative data, um, and what we've done here is we've got our auction signal from our electrode. This is your bold fMRI signal, quantitative signal. And we've shown that the two signals are essentially the same. Um, and that led to a paper where we were suggesting that the sensors can be used, uh, particularly the auction sensor, as a surrogate for fMRI monitoring in rodents. The problem in terms of drug discovery translation from clinical to preclinical to clinical is that you have to anesthetize the animal when you put them into an fMRI machine. So you can't do behavioral work. With the electrode, you can do behavioral work. So what we're saying is that the electrode can replace the fMRI machine, um, which is a, a pretty big uh, uh, a statement to make. Uh, but we've now started to validate that in more complex uh, models. Uh, and what I haven't talked about is the electrochemistry. There's a lot of electricity in the brain. It's well defined into different waves and so forth. 
And this was a paper published uh, about two years ago by a different group. What we want to do now is start relating the chemistry to the electricity. 